afternoon, good morning, and greetings appropriate for any other time of the day from wherever you are logging in. Uh, this is the second part of the masterclass uh, from Professor Shubhashish Banerjee on the topic of uh, electronic voting as part of the blockchains and uh, electoral democracy project at Karana. Uh, even, even though uh, you may be joining this one for the first time, uh, I think we would recommend that you watch both sessions together to get a better introduction to the topic. And because in isolation, it might slightly be, uh, it might be difficult to sort of understand and appreciate the amount of detail that has been covered across both these sessions. Uh, a few housekeeping notes before I hand it over to our host and moderator, Smart McCarthy. Uh, we will uh, be streaming this on YouTube. Uh, you can put questions on uh, the YouTube chat or here, and we will be presenting it to our uh, host and the speaker. You can uh, use the raise hand function in Zoom to um, queue up your questions or remarks. If you prefer not to use the raise hand function, you can always uh, put them in chat. We'll read them out for you. And uh, yes, I think with that, uh, there's no need to, for me at least, to go in a whole lot of ordinate introductions. I'll hand it over to Smari, and uh, with that, he can take it forward. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Um... Yeah, we're we're back. It's another week, and we are continuing with our discussion about electronic uh, voting systems. Um, so, I'm just going to keep it short so that we can get down to the uh, actual meat of the matter. But um, uh, in case you missed it last time, I I, I do uh, agree that it's a good idea to go back and watch the. Uh, the YouTube stream from last time, it, it was quite in, informative. But um, uh, again, we have with us uh, Professor Supashi Spanarji, who teaches at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. And he's been uh, involved in writing and educating and commenting uh, on the intersection of technology and society and politics. And, um, uh, and so what we're here to do today is uh, dig a little bit deeper into the specifics of uh, how to make these kinds of um, uh, electoral uh, electronic voting systems uh, reliable, uh, if at all possible. Uh, this is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Uh, as we went through last time, there are many things that need to be guaranteed in order to uh, make it all work. So. Hopefully, we'll all emerge from this more enlightened than we we go into it. Uh, so I'll I'll just hand it over to you, Subhashi. Right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Marty. So let me start with sharing my screen. Uh, okay. And. Um, Okay, so what I'll uh, so I'll start with electoral rolls too, and um, uh, do the voting part uh, uh, later, right? uh, um, because uh, you know as a computer scientist, I would think that if I have to attack an election system, I would attack the electoral rolls rather than the voting uh, system. Uh, electoral, you know, the voting system is under public uh, scrutiny. It's uh, sort of uh, out there for everybody to see whether electoral rules are something that can be attacked uh, at leisure, you know, much before the election and just one person swing, uh, deleting one person uh, voters, unwanted voters from the electoral rules is uh, enough to hack an election, you know, closely contested election. So, um, uh, so there was a um, you know, when we did this CC report on elections, there was this uh, uh, wonderful report by, and, uh, and, and sort of uh, astonishing report by V. Ramani and Harsh Mandar, which uh, talked about the disenfranchisement of the, of the voters, right? So apparently uh, voters from the marginalized communities, uh, they find it hard to get onto the voting list and they also find it hard to uh, stay on the voting list. So once they're on, uh, they tend to get deleted 
um, and uh, you know without notice without um, following necessarily following the rules and they go to the polling station and figure out their their names are simply not there so uh, and and in india probably in other places also there are no standards about maintenance of the electoral rolls right the integrity of the electoral rolls and some people are saying now that uh, the electoral roll should be on blockchain and that is what uh, maybe i'll address a little bit uh, little bit in this talk now um, in this talk i will have to get into a little bit of cryptography as i mentioned last time so uh, if there is any difficulty at any point of time please don't hesitate to just um, interrupt right? so just unmute yourself and enter okay so democracy principles demand that the integrity of electoral roll should be publicly verifiable and they seldom are right so the electoral roll is uh, usually downloadable from the eci website in india but they are not in a searchable form they are typically given as images and uh, uh, to do anything with them is sort of sort of impossible uh, they are also not properly rti you know so you cannot do an rti uh, file an rti to ask the question that why was my name deleted or was my, why was my address not updated uh, uh, you will be lucky if you get any answers so what are the verifiability requirements typically that all applications for inclusion and updates on the electoral rolls uh, by the voters or on their behalf uh, they should be correctly processed uh, that there should be no spurious deletions from the electoral rolls without notice and without um, citing reasons and of course deduplication for of an electoral roll is a crucial issue right uh, uh, and uh, but this is not all i mean this is something that probably technology can address but technology can't even address the problem of proactively identifying all eligible voters the inclusion problem right so the you know the the, the person on the road the person who sleeps on the street uh, the the lgbtq community persons so uh, so this is a social process to get people onto the electoral roll proactively even if they don't apply that's a process that um, computer science probably cannot cannot even address so we will uh, talk about the middle part the verifiability requirement and electoral roll attacks are uh, are not a myth right so uh, there's this two reports that i read uh, uh, that came out roughly about the same time in march 2019 Uh, that talked about uh, manipulation of electoral rolls in uh, two countries very very far apart on the other side of the of, of the earth. and these are uh, i mean i would recommend that you read both to understand the kind of attacks that go on right? and uh, they're not dissimilar you know one is a highly advanced country and one is uh, telangana and yet the nature of the attacks are uh, are very similar so, okay so uh, you know the solution that i have in mind and this is not a standard solution this is something that i just um, just thought thoughts uh, you know random thoughts that have occurred to my mind uh, on published stuff but these are uh, this is a proposal that we can uh, discuss right uh, so i think that uh, you know the, the the cryptographic tool that we can use uh, is a tool that came much much before blockchain it predates blockchain by at least 20 years and it's pretty well understood in computer science and it's a concept of an app and only public good in both right and it has two properties one is uh, certified published that anybody can determine that uh, who has published the bulletin uh, it's an app and only bulletin board and uh, sub authority of eci so we are assuming here that only the election commission of india will publish or the sub authorities and the identity uh, can be verified uh, and the time of publication uh, up to a certain bound you know maybe within 5 minutes within 10 minutes uh, the time of publication can be specified uh, and also be determined and the append only public bullet in most board must have an unalterable history and what does it mean so this is called immutable in the language of uh, blockchain or non repudiable so this shows that any reader can verify that at times t1 and t0 t1 greater than t0 
the board at T0 is a prefix of the board at T1, which means that nothing has got deleted and uh, or altered, but something has got added. Right? As time progresses, things can only get added. That's happened only properly. And uh, failure to determine either will indicate uh, malfeasance in the process of the election commission of India or corruption. Right. So this is a notion of a public bulletin board. It's a very well understood uh, cryptographic system that is probably 30, 40 years old. Right? Uh, so I am suggesting that uh, you should, um, for electoral rules, have two bulletin boards. A bulletin board, first one is a bulletin board of transaction records. Uh, and this should contain the sequence of all enrollment applications received and enrollment records generated by the uh, registration offices. Right? So this is uh, uh, enrollment um, and, and also all change and deletion requests. So any request that has got generated uh, in the system must be put up on the bulletin board uh, in, a, in a way that it cannot be altered. And any processing uh, that has been done on those applications uh, with reasons uh, given. Right? So this is the bare minimum that you require to make it auditable. Right. So, and this has to be unalterable. Once done, it's done. Right. So, you cannot go back on. Um, and the second one is derived from the first one is a bulletin board of electoral. So, this is contained a uh, self contained bulletin board of the entire electoral role, updated with all additions, deletions, and changes till date, append only, where each entry is time stamped and digitally signed by a competent authority in the ECI. Who has who has uh, added that thing on the bulletin board? Who has deleted that thing on the bulletin board? And uh, linked to the first bulletin board. So the current electoral role can be computed publicly uh, from from the second bulletin board. Right. So anybody can should be able to should, should be able to compute the electoral role. And this is constituency wise. So every constituency should maintain uh, its own bulletin board. Uh, the blockchain proponents are, uh, you know, suggest something like that. They say that the, you know, they think of the bulletin board as a blockchain. Now, uh, the blockchain is a hammer that has many, many other things uh, other than a bulletin board. The bulletin board is a part of it. Uh, and I would argue that those additional things may sometimes make the problem more complicated and actually add insecurity to the to it. I'll, I'll come and discuss that a little bit. Uh, more detail. So the cryptographic building blocks that you require to build a bulletin board are just two. Right? Uh, they're, it's a very simple construct. So all you require is a digital signature, a uh, public key uh, based signing system. So where uh, sign and verify are two public functions. Uh, and a message uh, can be signed with the secret key. Uh, that's a secret key. So the message can be signed with a secret key. Uh, and the signed signature is S. And given the message in the S, anybody can verify, uh, anybody who has the public key of the signing authority can verify that the uh, that this is indeed is the signature of that message and the message has not been altered. So that's a standard notion of a digital signature. And the second notion that we require is a hash function. A hash function is, uh, so you've got a message, a uh, hash function is H uh, and you, you get a, uh, small h, which is called a hash. And a hash function is a one-way function, which means that it is easy to go from the message to the hash, but given the hash, it is almost impossible to find the message, to construct the message. So you can go one way, you cannot invert the function. And the second property follows from the first, it's, a, it's called collision resistant, which is to say that uh, finding two different messages, message one and message two, such that the hashes are the same, is computationally impossible. Uh, right? it, uh, so when we say computationally difficult in computer science, we, we mean that a, uh, an adversary with bounded resources cannot, cannot do this. An adversary who has only access to a uh, reasonable amount of computing uh, will not be able to uh, break a hash function, right? So, or violate any one of the two properties. So, it is impossible to construct a false message uh, with the same hash, and it is impossible to uh, 
uh, find the message given the hash. Right? So these are the two, two main properties. So how does a public bulletin board work? Uh, a public bulletin board, um, you know, based construction works in the following way that a bulletin board has uh, these components. Uh, MI is a message. Every bulletin I has a message, has a timestamp, uh, has a writer's identification. Uh, this is the identity of the writer. Uh, as a hash and has two signatures, right? So, and it must satisfy the following invariant property that uh, the hash at every stage must be computed by applying the hash function on the concatenation of the message, the timestamp, the writer identity, and the previous hash, right? So this is something that is in computer science called a hash chain, right? Uh, so this is a, this is a hash chain. And, uh, the writer must sign the sign the hash uh, using uh, the writer's secret key, and the bulletin board must sign the uh, writer's signature and the bulletin board's timestamp. The bulletin board's timestamp should be within a small delay of the writer's timestamp. Okay. So, so that is the that is the requirement of a bulletin board. So, given this hash chain by the property of the hash function. This bulletin board is tamper proof. Right? So nobody can, once a message has gone onto the bulletin board, uh, if the hash function is strong enough and if the hash function is not broken, it is almost, um, it is impossible to alter a message. Right? So this is the, makes an append only bulletin board. Uh, how is it different from a blockchain? Uh, it is different from a blockchain. Blockchain has got two constraints. So one is the hash chain. Um, you know, uh, every block is hashed and in exactly this, this manner. But uh, there is also a, you know, blockchain has multiple parties, uh, party one, party two, party three, you know, uh, depending on whether the blockchain is private or public. Uh, if the blockchain is public, then anybody can join as an authority in a blockchain. If the, uh, if the blockchain is permissioned or a private blockchain, then only a few people who are uh, who are allowed can can join. And these guys must agree using a very complicated uh, consensus algorithm that what items should go onto the blockchain. Right? Uh, so what gets added onto the blockchain is decided by a distributed consensus algorithm. That's the only way the blockchain is different from from a public bulletin board that I described out here. Now, in this case, uh, there is only one authority, right? It's an election authority. And uh, so there is no question of a multiple consensus deciding what should be on. So that does not give us any security, right? So if the three election commissioners try to decide, they can collude and they can pull voters, right? So, so that's, a, that's, an, uh, that's, a, that's an insecure protocol. What is required out here and what is often not understood, it what should get onto the blockchain uh, is determined by a receipt. So anytime there is an application, uh, there has to be a there has to be a searchable uh, reference to an issued receipt. So once you have issued a receipt, once the election commission has issued receipt to a voter uh, for, for any kind of an application for enrollment or change application then the election commissioner is obligated to put up an end. If a voter can produce a receipt for which no processing information is there on the bulletin board, then that is a malfeasance on the part of the election authority. So what gets added onto the bulletin board is determined by what receipts are issued by the application or what commitment. So anytime you issue a receipt, you give a commitment that I'll process this application. I'll either accept it or reject it or do whatever. And there has to be a corresponding entry. So if you can produce a receipt with a certain date and corresponding to which there is no processing information in the bulletin board, then that indicates malpractice. So you don't really require complicated consensus algorithms. Right? So this is a simple tool uh, which can be used and you never need a blockchain for this. And, uh, uh, but amazingly for this problem, the internet is full of complicated blockchain-based solutions. So, uh, privacy, a voter's list is an incredible privacy problem. 
there is a privacy versus public verifiability issue comes out uh, in the most prominent way in a in a in a voter system, in an electoral role. Uh, so, in an electoral role in a country like India, where the names are disclosed, caste and religion, uh, this is a nightmare issue. So, election commission of India's response to this is to keep the electoral rule as an unsearchable image, as a bit map, right? Um, now, that does not give any privacy, right? Just to make that it is not, um, you know, it's not searchable by ordinary means. Uh, there's an assumption which is uh, of privacy, uh, which I think is uh, incorrect. If you want privacy, I'm not saying that privacy is desirable out there, right? That's not for me to decide. That's not for a, a designer to decide. That's for the society and the uh, and the parliament to decide. But if you want privacy, uh, head is away. You can replace each, each message in a bulletin board with a hash, okay? Uh, so, uh, Subhashish, yes, um, yes. just a quick question from the chat about uh, whether the number of collisions is also required to be bounded. Um, oh, of course, yes. The number of collisions in a hash uh, has to be bounded. You know, so I am not getting into the properties of a hash function, but there are many, many hash functions that do it. You know, that are that are that are collision resistant. Actually, hash functions have got a problem that they get broken, and newer hash functions come and they get broken, so it's a cycle. So it's a game between the cryptographer and the attacker. It's a continuous game. But there are secure hash functions that are reasonably collision resistant. And uh, one can show that um, collisions can happen only with a negligible probability. That's sort of easy to show in cryptography. Uh, and for privacy, uh, you know, so access to the unalterable messages, so the hashing, just publicly replacing the message with hashes gives you the untamperability. And access to the unalterable messages can only be given to authorized entities, you know, representative of political parties after authentication. Special auditors, now whether only special auditors should audit or whether it should be publicly audited, uh, that is a question that needs to be asked in the parliament and, and, and decided. So, uh, then there was this question about remote offline voting. Uh, migrants, 200 million migrants in India who do not vote. Uh, um, to my mind, the solution is again, uh, you know, take application from them, uh, whether they want to vote from their uh, home in Begu Sarai or they want to vote from Delhi. Uh, and they want to vote for which constituency, maintain status of all applications on public bulletin boards. Then reconcile across constituencies, constituencies and publish final electoral rules. Uh, and then finally hold offline multi day uh, polling stations at remote locations. For example, in Delhi, uh, at a polling booth, uh, you should hold uh, multi day polling, which means that all 542 constituencies in the country, it should be possible to vote from Delhi. And this is not internet voting. You should be able to go select which constituency you are voting for, cast your ballot, that's called multi-race polling station voting. And post-election, the results can be, you know, uploaded and for counting. Uh, so I'll, I'll discuss that bit later. But this is a, you know, what may appear to be a simple solution to maintenance of electoral rules, at least the part of it that can be technically addressed. And this does not require uh, complicated consensus protocol and blockchain. Right? Uh, yeah. So I will uh, move on to voting. Uh, I'll stop here on electoral rules. But if there are questions, then we can maybe have a short discussion. Yeah, you want to uh, do some questions on on the electoral rules? Yeah, maybe maybe we can take a couple of questions before I get on to voting. Yes, okay, that's actually a good idea. And uh, I just wanted to add, uh, because of uh, Nildara's question about the uh, bounding conditions of the collisions, uh, that <laughs> it, it's a useful thing to know about the hashing functions that are, so 
what we'd call a cryptographic hash function. So a hash function that is useful for cryptographic purposes, that it'll have a uniform distribution on the image and that the image will be equal to the codomain. Uh, yes. And that's, that statistical property basically guarantees a certain uh, bounding of the collision rate. Um, yes. uh, so that, you know, so, so you typically have to show that the collision probabilities are negligible. Right, it is less than a piece of specified epsilon. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Anand. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi. So I have a question about um, uh, how do you really make this tamper proof? Uh, so let's say if it's a BI bulletin has been published, uh, what stops from uh, the officials to publish a BI uh, dash the next day? by making some changes to it? Uh, the, the, the assumption is that the, the authorities will not be able to uh, uh, not be able to fudge the hash functions. They won't be so able to compute the hash functions. They're not, but let's say, let's take B9 and then they did a B10 now, okay. Yes. Now so they B, can create B, a... B, B10 will have the hash of B9. True, got it. Okay. Now, what stops them from actually releasing another version of B10 mm -hmm. using the same old hash the next day? Uh, they can. You know, it is up to them. So, whatever they put up, the onus is on them to uh, be answerable for that. You know, the question is that whatever they have put up, they okay. cannot go back and alter it. And if they, whatever they have put up, don't uh, explain uh, what has happened to my application, right? It is publicly viewable. Anybody can figure out that they have not uh, processed my application correctly. Yeah. So, 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 as long as they give a commitment and a receipt, it is obligatory on their part to process it correctly. They cannot hide anything. Yeah. But, but, but my, my point is like even forking the, the chain that you have is still possible because uh, I can rewrite, I can. Uh, so you uh, can fork the chain. But yeah. whether you want to do that or not, you know, ultimately through these bulletins, you are explaining that you have processed my information correctly. So whatever you do, fork or do whatever you want, ultimately the ECI has to ex give an explanation to everybody, which anybody in the public can. Check. So if they have done something wrong, it is evident on the bullet. No, so my point is like using the hash function here is not adding any value because uh, 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 the authorities can fork and actually create a new, ch new chain uh, at any point. So uh, there's no value actually using the- You know, in whichever chain you take, all the precedent hashes are included. So HI contains HI minus one. So the hash invariance property has to be satisfied by every chain. Yeah. And if you fork a chain, even the new chain is not altered. You to, can fork but, as many chains as you want, but you cannot no, alter anything. No, to, uh, I get the point. So I mean, uh, unless someone is kind of having an archive of the chain that's been published, Yes. Like uh, a gadget that's yeah. kind of published and that's unalterable. Okay, something like yeah. that. The property is yes. there. Without yeah. having something like that, having a chain, I don't see. Yeah. So, how so the so the so the assumption is anything that you have published, somebody has downloaded. But who has yeah. downloaded? Uh, or what has or you or, or or you upload? You know, the election commission uploads to NIS. Anything that they have downloaded, you know, maybe Congress and BJP, they they both download it. Yeah. So you need something like that. Yeah, so you need to have a, a third party verifiable agency where this goes there. And uh, so, unless you have yeah. that third agent, the agency yeah. that uh, uh, verifies and says that uh, this has been altered, I mean, we don't, I mean, this alone is, doesn't seem to be. Yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so, you know, so, e so every message is signed. So they cannot go back on their words. So, somebody else should have a copy of the bulletin. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else has to download the bulletin board period. So it, yeah, it that's, might, a, that's a minor point, you know, so that can be easily taken care of. It might also you, be useful to, to think of this in terms of um, if you are, uh, one of the reasons for maintaining the hash is so that you can uh, cheaply verify that nothing has changed, right? Yeah, because if you have to maintain the entire database and then compare mm -hmm. all of it every time, then that becomes expensive for large databases. Yes. And the hash chain gives you easy methods to verify. It. Yeah. So, um, so this public bulletin board is uh, construct and uh, 
computer science, uh, which is very, very old. It's 40, 50 year old and uh, has been used, you know, it's extensively used construct. And many times when people talk blockchain, what they really require is a public bullet. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they really don't want a blockchain. A blockchain is required for a cryptocurrency uh, because, uh, so unless you want a consensus on the ordering of the transactions, which you don't need in this case, you don't need a blockchain. All you need is a public bulletin board, which is a very simple construct and can be programmed like that. It's, just, it's a trivial thing to program. Yeah. Um, there's one more question uh, here from Abhishek um, for maintaining and uploading uh, of electoral rolls. On whom does the onus fall? Uh, also, what happens to citizens, voters who are not early tech adopters can are there any predictions as to when such a system can be put in place so um you know the block this public bulletin board has to be maintained by an authority and you have to have a protocol that they upload to some three other sites that they don't control anytime they publish they have to upload to three other sites that they don't control so that requires a so verification um you know uh, pundits can verify for you. So you can, so of course, you if you are unable to compute a hash, you can take it to Hasgate and Hasgate can verify for you. So, you know, you can bring it to IIT Delhi and, uh, you know, some, some students can verify. So, so the thing is, the public bulletin board is out there, downloadable by everybody in the world. Uh, and anybody who, anybody can verify. So you can go to your friend and ask the friend to verify. Yeah. So, um, you know, if public bulletin board is putting it like publishing in Indian Express, uh, so you can't go back on what you have published. That's a that's the analogy. That as long as you put your processing information and publish it every day in Indian Express, enough number of people have copies of it, and it is impossible for you to go back and change a record. So, simply put, that's a, that's the analogy. So uh, two more questions, and then uh, I think we should move on and maybe take more questions on the whole afterwards. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, Arian uh, asks, uh, well, it says it brings us to an interesting question about who owns the infrastructure of the blockchain. Uh, do we trust the existing government or any private entity doing so? And I think that just generally comes down to the, the trust in uh, do we... Um, do we generally trust uh, these information sources and can we just assume that somebody is checking all of the, the, the bulletins? Uh, so, you know, the, the notion of a public bulletin board is precisely because you don't have to trust anybody. See, you have to make a law so that the, it is the election authorities' responsibility to publish the public bulletin board. You know, they can publish it in whatever hardware, whatever software they want. You don't care as long as these hashes are and are correct and the messages are down there on the list. Now, the correctness of this, uh, it just depends on independent parties having copies of this. Right? Uh, so what are the standard independent parties who will be interested in this? The political parties who are part contesting the election. They have a natural interest in downloading this and keeping an interest in it. Yeah. And if two political parties, political party one and political party two, they have downloaded and they have a contest about which is the correct bullet in board, anybody can verify from the hashes and the signs. So, so, so that is unalterable and uh, that's cryptographically secure. So the, 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 the purpose of a bullet in board is to remove the trust requirement from it. Okay. So it's the, it's, so from a trust requirement, you go to an obligation requirement. It's the obligation of the Election Commission of India to demonstrate that every application has been processed. Yeah. So uh, I'll take one more uh, question from YouTube. Um, uh, can you please explain the protocol from the perspective of uh, that we need to register a voter um, voters entry to count votes while leaving out who the voter voted for. So essentially oh. vote, uh, right to confidential vote. I think this is probably what you're getting to. So it might be yeah. a bit uh, too uh, detailed. So for the, for the electoral role, all you have to do is to go to an electoral uh, office, uh, file an application and get a receipt for it that I have filed an application and you have accepted my application. Right. 
and that's it. And with that application, you can search in the bulletin board uh, for satisfaction. Right? So whether your application has been processed or not. So that's uh, that's all that a voter has to has to. Has to. And uh, okay. yeah, so a lot of this just harkens back to um, you know uh, so what we were talking about last time about um, uh, having a single national registry and how this bulletin board approach is essentially equivalent to doing just that in in practice. But, yes. So I, what I am saying is a bulletin board per constituency, and I have uh, carefully avoided the national identity uh, linkage. Right. Uh, you know, deliberately so. Now that's an open question. How to link it with a national identity and how to do the deduplication publicly on a bulletin board mm -hmm. uh, is a question. I have a lot of thoughts on it, but maybe for some other day. Yeah. Well, right. uh, I guess we should move on to your next uh, next part, and right. uh, we'll get to more questions at the end. Sure. Thanks. And that is uh, about verifiable voting, right? Uh, so I am. Um, so again, uh, I'll start with the. With the with the with the with the declaration that I am not really recommended that you move to verifiable voting, right? Not at all. Uh, in fact, I have great hesitation in making that recommendation. Uh, I am making this presentation just to illustrate verifiable voting. Yeah. So, so uh, just to recap, uh, what did we discuss uh, last time? Uh, that uh, you know there is. Um, Almost all jurisdictions require a voter verified paper ballot. Uh, and uh, the only thing that is considered safe in an election right now, uh, according to law of most countries, including India, is this quadrant pressing voting in person uh, with voter verifiable paper ballots. Uh, so, India, so, so almost all of Europe, uh, except Switzerland and uh, countries like Estonia. Um, all of United States, uh, they just operate in the in the first person. And um, US also does mail-in ballot, uh, which is remote. So you um, use postal ballots to do it. So does India. Uh, and uh, this is considered slightly unsafe because when you are doing a ballot, uh, you know, when you are filling in the ballot uh, and putting it in an envelope in your home, uh, you can be coerced by your family members or um, God knows who else, who else is there at your home uh, who can coerce you. So this is considered more risky. Uh, internet and blockchain voting, uh, you know, there is there is no way to resolve the coercion problem uh, when you are doing an internet-based voting. So we discussed it in the last, last class. And uh, there's been an enormous uh, amount of... Uh, material written by Ron Rivest and others to, to show that why this is not even a possibility uh, and why blockchain voting is um, the strict no-no. And I will not get into that today. And uh, But I have uh, posted a paper by the MIT folks, folks on that. A DRE voting we discussed last time, direct, this is direct record electronic in an EVM. It's also considered unsafe because uh, there is no obvious way to prove who you voted for, whether the, the machine has recorded your intention correctly, right? Uh, that's an impossibility to, to, to prove. What India uses is somewhere in between the pressing voting and a DRE voting, right? It's a, it uses a DRE in a pressing and gives a VVPR, right? So it's an EVM plus VVPAT solution, which takes the DRE into the pressing voting thing. And at least it gives a VVPAT, so which is um, more acceptable. Uh, uh, and as we have discussed in the last time, it will be acceptable if the VVPAT is truly voted verifiable, right? So what did we discuss uh, in the last time? For those who have missed it, we discussed that uh, evidence-based election is auditability plus audit. So you first must have auditability. If you don't have auditability, then the election protocol is invalid. But just auditability does not give you evidence. You have to actually conduct an audit. So if I have to, again, write down the data, the first data is, of course, uh, ballot secrecy. Uh, then we discussed this at length in the last class. Uh, so we said that uh, we request software independence, which is to say that this is not to say that you don't use software, but you, this is to say that if there is a change in the software, um, 
either willful change or uh, an inadvertent change uh, in the software or in the hardware, then that should be auditable. So the that should not cause an undetectable change in the election outcome. Okay. So, so if the software has got changed, then that should always be detectable. And then we say that uh, that should always be possible to catch it in an audit. So that's something that we call software independence. Almost all uh, countries require you to have voter verifiable paper records. And these are the ballots. Uh, so because these are the ballots, so they cannot fall, uh, as we discussed, uh, into a sack uh, behind a glass window, like it happens in India. Right? That's not voter verifiable. A voter verifiable is that you know I can use my agency uh, to, to cancel if I think that the you know that the EVM has not recorded my vote right, and ultimately the correct solution almost always is if I get the VVPR in my hand and put it in a box, right? That means I completely and totally agree with what has been printed on the VVPR. So uh, the Indian voting solution is not that, and this requires a change. Then, of course, you require con contestability. So if you say that the EVM has not recorded my vote correctly, or if the VVPR has printed my vote wrong, right now the Indian system is not contestable. I mean, you can shout, but you will never be able to prove that you are not lying. Right, and they'll impose a five thousand rupee fine on you. Uh, that is uh, that is not correct. So, of course, you require contestability, and finally, you require an audit. So, if you look at the Indian system and all systems all over, they assume that the sack containing the VOFO voter verifiable paper record is untampered. That's an assumption. The custody chain of it is. Uh, made trustworthy by traditional methods like uh, putting seals like each candidate and each political party puts a seal on it and they follow it uh, uh, and they, they ensure that it gets into the strong room correctly and the seal is never opened and so if you assume that the voter verified paper record is untamperable those sacks are untamperable then you can use this vvpat slips or vvpr slips to do an audit of the electronic account, right? So in India, we said that the audit procedure is not correct. Uh, you know, that's what we discussed in the last class, uh, that you don't do adequate statistical audit. But if you have the VVPR and if you assume that the VVPR uh, is trustworthy, then potentially you can do an audit uh, by depending on us, uh, do a statistical or a full manual audit by, uh, by following a protocol, right? Uh, sensible protocol. And that is the desire data for all, all elections. So most of the current elections, they use the trust on VVPR and an audit of the VVPR. So that's, and that's what gives them software independence, sort of half and half software independence. And because what is the weak point out there? The weak point out there is that ensuring that the VVPRs have not been tampered. Right? That some, some, some voter verified paper audit trails have not been thrown away and new ones have not got added. You know, in the in the transit. So, what uh, we will question today is: Can end-to-end -end public verifiability using cryptography help? Right. So, it turns out, or it is well known in computer science that you can use cryptographic technique to give guarantees for all of this. Right. Uh, almost perfect guarantees for all of this. And yet computer scientists and others don't recommend that they be used and they are almost never used in any election. Uh, but uh, many people think that it's just a matter of time that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, the, that, the, that the people at large will get more familiar with cryptography and cryptography will become more acceptable and, uh, and they'll get used in, uh, to solve all of these problems, including the trustworthiness of the VVPR trend. Uh, whether that will happen or when that will happen or whether it is desirable to happen is not for me to answer. Um, okay? I have always believed that it is the job of the computer scientists to operationalize and never to decide what should happen. Okay? Uh, but um, lay out the pros and cons that if this happens, then what are the, what are the risks? Right? Uh, correct. So um, that's what I'll do. I'll describe... Uh, prototypical cryptographic system that can take care of all of this and uh, 
and then throw the question open to all of you whether they should be used or not. <coughs> so let me start by reviewing some popular E2E verifiable system, right? And uh, because Mari uh, asked the question of homomorphic computing, I'll start with the homomorphic computing system. And this is a very, very uh, popular system called Scratch and Vote, very elegant. Uh, so this uses, um, what is called a preta voter style ballots. And this kind of ballots were made popular by, by preta voter, so uh, which is an old voting system. And what do you have? You have the candidate's uh, name in the left hand side of the ballot in a random order. You have the marking space in the right hand side uh, of the ballot. And uh, typically, the voter uh, puts a tick uh, on the ballot, the marks it, tears it off from the middle discards the left half. The left half is shredded in the polling booth. Uh, so nobody knows this. Uh, you go into the polling booth, put your tick mark and discard the left half. Uh, this ballot, of course, has to be a covered ballot. Then you go out of the polling booth and give the right half to an election officer who puts it in a scanner. Uh, so the right half is scanned. Uh, and note that the right half, uh, the polling officer or, or nobody can determine who you voted for because all they know that is that you voted in the uh, third position or the second position. Uh, since the left half is gone, this is perfectly safe. Uh, and in a uh, homomorphic backend, what you have is that, that you have an encryption uh, of this randomness. So this has got, in this case, there are four candidates. So this has got four sections. So this, this QR code will have four sections. The first section will encode uh, the vector 1, 0, 0, 0. The second will encode the vector 0, 1, 0, 0. The third will encode the vector 0, 0, 1, 0. And the fourth will encode the vector 0, 0, 0, 1. Right? Uh, so that's, and the encryption parameters are here, um, you know, under this scratch cover, which should normally uh, be opened uh, only for audit. So these are ballots that are kept outside a polling booth. And uh, before election starts, uh, auditors, which should include candidates, uh, representatives, and, uh, and members of the public, they can pick up a statistically significant sample uh, from, the, from the ballot box, open up this, and, and, and ensure for themselves that the encryption is correct. So you have to typically, if you have got N ballots, uh, sampling order login ballots for correctness uh, ensures that all ballots are correct with a very high priority. Right? So once election commences, the assumption is that all ballots are all ballots are correct. So that's a scratch and vote. I'll tell you that how the counting happens later. Uh, then there are mixed net based backends. Mixed net based backends are very similar in principle, but instead of the encryption, uh, you have uh, a code out here, which is called an onion, right? Uh, now, with this onion, uh, this is a committed at the back end. So, so this ballot cannot be audited on the spot. Uh, but what can be done is that that uh, a login sample of ballots can be collected uh, from the polling booth, uh, assuming that they are correct. The polling can go on, and these ballots can be audited later. Right. You can, after election, you can audit that these, uh, so these ballots are all committed before. So you can audit that every ballot that was picked up was correct. So which would in turn imply that every ballot that was used was also correct. And typically in these kinds of ballots, the left card is discarded after polling. Uh, the randomness of the right card is standard the EVM as a take home receipt. So you take the right, right part as a receipt back home. Uh, oh, sorry. I have to aim correctly. Uh, okay, so in scratch and vote in the homomorphic encryption, uh, what is the protocol? This is by Adida and Rivest. Uh, Adida has a voting company now, uh, which is very famous. Uh, I, I, I have to ask him whether he's making money, but he makes electronic voting uh, protocols. Uh, and that's a startup. Uh, so uh, these receipts that you have take home, taken home are displayed on a public voting board, exactly of the type that I described. Uh, so every receipt, uh, the election commission uh, 
puts up on a public bulletin board. These are the voter IDs, Alice, Bridget, Carol, and so on. So they are the voter IDs. So anybody who has voted can take the uh, receipt, use the QR code to look up the receipt on the bulletin board and ensure that the receipt is there on the board, that uh, your vote is counted, your vote is recorded uh, correctly, and your vote is being counted. And um, then uh, the election commission does a public homomorphic counting on the bullet board. So, so multiplying these encryptions. So in this case, you pick up the second encryption. In this case, this case you pick up the third encryption. In this case, you pick up the second encryption. In this case, you pick up the last encryption. Multiply all of them, and the homomorphic. So you multiply the encryption, and that turns out to be an encryption of the summation. Right. Uh, so that's the homomorphic property. So you do the computation in the encryption domain. So anybody in the public, you know, who knows how to write a program, can uh, download the bulletin board and do this computation. And this computation is exactly equivalent to this computation. So finally, the election authority provides a zero knowledge proof uh, that without revealing the encryption. Uh, the election authority gives a proof that the decryption has been done correctly. Right? The final decryption of this uh, tally has been done correctly. Right? So this is a system that I believe was used in Maryland as a pilot uh, and uh, discarded, uh, not because it did not work, but because the public did not quite understand what was going on. This sounded a little bit like magic to them. And, uh, and magic cannot be allowed in an election. So this was has not been tried since. Uh, and this is not compatible with the VVPR. Uh, this is not compatible with the VVPR for the reason that, uh, look, the, the EVM, uh, which is scanning the right part, doesn't get to know the vote. So it doesn't know what the vote is, right? Uh, that's, a, that's an encrypted vote. So an EVM, because it doesn't know the vote, it cannot leak the vote. But the flip side is that it cannot even print the vote on a VVPR, right? So this is not at all compatible with the VVPR. Uh, what is the advantage? The advantage is that, that you do not require special EVMs. Uh, you can use an app on a cell phone as the EVM, right? So that's, that's also fine. Uh, so almost anything uh, will work as an, as an EVM, uh, you know, simple scanners, cell phones, uh, you know, the electoral officer's cell phone is a good enough EVM. So all he needs to do is just to scan and upload to the public bulletin board. And he cannot uh, not upload something because the receipt against ensures that, uh, you know, a voter who turns out with a correct receipt, signed receipt, uh, and doesn't find the receipt in the bulletin board uh, has a proof that something has gone wrong, the election has gone wrong. So the, it's the authority's responsibility to answer for every receipt that has been issued. So that gives you the accountability. Uh, and so, this is a system that probably cannot be hacked uh, um, very just, easily. Uh, inject here, uh, bec because you have that uh, formula for public homomorphic counting. Uh, it does seem that that, uh, that scheme would be very sensitive to... Um, so in the event of somebody injecting uh, a, a message of some kind that was purposefully um, uh, poisoned somehow. Um, yes. Um, and, yeah. So I am not getting into the detail. They have got no. a poison checking method. But uh, they you have got a... essentially have one spoiled vote invalidate the entire election. And that's a sensitivity that you'd normally not want in a system. Yeah. So they have a cover for it. Uh, no, they, they, they use a signing mechanism on top of this. It checks the grammar that every encryption is of a, of a, of a correct grammar. And uh, you cannot inject a spurious one. So the validity of each receipt uh, is verified using another zero knowledge. So I'm not getting into that detail. I'm just explaining in a in a in a rough concept so so for those details you can read the original paper uh, of adida and Rivest. Uh, uh, this is considered a very safe scheme but um, of course there are usability issues and um, and hence uh, nobody talks about it right? this, this is sort of a more of an has become uh, has been relegated to an academic uh, academic paper 
Uh, but this gives an idea very strongly, and this is an election that cannot be tampered, cannot be forged, uh, publicly verifiable, and, and all of that. Um, there is a small attack possible. I'll I'll, I'll discuss that attack uh, later. Okay. Uh, the other popular voting schemes are, uh, you know, this is one scantinity, and instead of. Uh, homomorphic encryption, many of this voting protocol use a concept called mixnet. That's another cryptographic protocol. The ones with the onions, they use a mixnet. So what is an onion? The onion is, uh, so a mixnet is a sequence of shufflers, right? Uh, shufflers and encryptors. So you, uh, so these shufflers and encryptors, so this is like, what is a mixnet? Uh, so if you use a VPN or a proxy like Tor, that's a mixnet. Right, so that hides the destination from the from the source. You know that gives you an anonymity between the destination and the source. So uh, these shuffles and the encryption corresponding to the shuffles are publicly committed before the election. Uh, so each shuffle can be by a different organization. There can be different trustees. Uh, uh, you know that uh, that are responsible for these shuffles. Uh, so the first shuffle can be by trustee one, the second shuffle can be by trustee two. And each, so it's called an onion because the first shuffle, uh, the first uh, shuffler puts his own encryption and the second shuffler encrypts the first encryption and so on and so forth. So finally, when you decrypt, you have to peel off the onion or uh, keep decrypting uh, using the public key of each, each trustee and finally you get the decryption, right? And uh, post voting, um, so you keep the mapping, uh, between candidates and uh, and the serial number, the candidate order in the shufflers. And uh, depending on the process that you get, uh, you pass the cross to the, to the shuffler and at the end of this, you get a public bulletin board. So you have got a public bulletin board at the beginning of the shuffler where every voter can verify that um, her receipt is there. Uh, and then uh, there is a public bulletin, final bulletin board with all the serial numbers are removed and you uh, have got uh, all the votes in clear text and anybody can, anybody with a computer can download this public bulletin board and add the votes and, uh, and get the output, right? So that there's been no cheating at any of the shuffler can be proved using zero knowledge proofs uh, using mixed encryption. So there is a, a paper by Lundin and Rayan in 2008 that showed uh, that one of the mixnet schemes was made uh, compatible with the VVPR. Uh, and this VVPR required, so the votes had to be encrypted on the VVPR slips. And each VVPR slip at the counting station requires a decryption, which makes it a little uh, unusable, right? So you have to take every VVPR slip and use an independent key to decrypt before you can do a VVPR audit at the counting station. Now that will make counting go on forever. Um, the auditing will go on forever. And again, this paper was relegated to be one only of academic interest. I'm not sure that this mixnet based protocol, at least this one, has ever been tried. Mixnets without VVPRs have been tried in large elections. Uh, uh, in, in, in the United States uh, and uh, at the pilot level, but they have not become popular. You know, at the, so those pilots were considered to be, to be failures. So though you can give mathematical proofs that this is tamper free, uh, convincing the public that it is the case is, is hard and the public doesn't even understand what is going on. So, so that's not considered to be a valid or a proper, proper election. Uh, right. Um, and both of these uh, are something that has been not used in India because India decided to move away from handmarked ballots. And uh, I am told that India's reason for moving away from handmarked ballots is that, that a significant percentage of our population is uh, unlettered. And that results, and these are people who have never held a pen or never held a are not used to stamping, and they apparently did not put the tick in the right location. So they put the tick in between the two candidates, or uh, you know, put the stamp in between the two candidates, and that resulted in a huge number of ballots getting wasted. Right. 
So invalid ballot problem was incredibly high, especially in the rural constituencies in India. And, um, and this is the reason why uh, the Election Commission of India in the early 2000s decided not to use this paper ballot. So they discarded this. Uh, so US uh, does not use a DRE, direct record electronic system at all. It's almost always a paper ballot and scanning system, right? So they are culturally more tuned to it. Uh, and that's the way it works. And most places that use a ballot is hand-marked paper ballot. But India uses a DRE system, which is direct record electronic. And making those verifiable, as I mentioned a little bit in the last class, is much, much harder. Uh, because the recorded as intended guarantees, uh, you know, the proofs that one has to give, they turn out to be particularly complicated. So there is one system uh, by Adida and uh, Neff and uh, called Mark Pledge. Uh, there the voter needs to get into a challenge response with, with the machine and the voter has to repeatedly match five digit strings uh, you know, several times. So it's an interactive proof between the voter and the, uh, it's an interactive cryptographic proof between the voter and the EVM. And uh, and you can guess that's not popular. So that's uh, that's just a paper. Uh, Star vote, on the other hand, it's a 19 author paper uh, by Rivest and you know all those people are on this on this paper. Uh, this is a completely provable uh, DRE protocol, which I will not describe. Uh, I'll describe something. Uh, we have cooked up. So, similar to this. Uh, this is being deployed and tested in large elections um, in Germany and in uh, you know pre-banning, uh, actually post-banning. This was tested uh, with the Supreme Court's permission, I think in Saarbrück and post-banning in Germany. And uh, this was also tested in some, uh, uh, some, some US elections, right? Uh, this supports WBPR, and but this requires so the the, the way that uh, the way that you give a proof to your voter that your vote has been recorded correctly is that you encrypt the vote. This is homomorphic encryption, so you encrypt the voter's vote, and then the voter can challenge that. Show me that you have encrypted my vote correctly. So this is called a cast or a cast cast false vote and challenge. So if at least 50% of the voters do a false cast and challenge, then you can show that with an overwhelming probability, this is correct for all voters. But, um, you know, casting false votes and challenging uh, is a protocol, whether it is practical, whether voters would uh, be able to uh, follow this protocol or will understand the need for it, uh, which is a big question. So for obvious reasons, cost or challenge protocols are not very popular. It's a, it's a cryptographic construct that is uh, uh, you know, considered to be slightly meaningless. And star vote um, is a great protocol, but it could not quite figure out how to get rid of this step. So this step comes out again because it's a DRE machine. You press a button uh, for Congress, and the machine, how does it prove that it is a recorded Congress inside? That's a problem, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's a problem that requires solving, and that problem is not easy to solve. Uh, so, if this is uh, with this background, I'll move on and try to build a solution that addresses all of this, right? So, and uh, as we move along, we'll see that it is not easy. It will make the system somewhat complicated. Right? And uh, whether it's complicated enough or it's easy enough is a subjective decision. But at least technically, all these problems can be addressed. And that's what we will endeavor to show as we move along. So I'll need some crypto basics, right? So I'll try to keep this very, very simple. But uh, since it is crypto based, uh, I couldn't figure out a way to avoid the, the basic crypto. Right. So I'll need exactly two things. Uh, the first one is I'll no, need the notion of a commitment. Uh, so what's a commitment? A commitment is that you commit a value, like 
x is equal to five, right? So you you commit the value five to x, and uh, you know the 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 metaphor is that you put it in a box, you commit the value, you put it in a box, you keep the key and give away the box, right? So your commitment is a secret. Nobody can peep inside the box and see that what you have committed. Uh, that's not possible. Uh, uh, so you know this guy will have to keep on wondering what the number is uh, forever. And you cannot change the value because you don't have the box. You've written the key, but you've given away the box. So you cannot change the value. So once you have committed, you have committed, right? There's no going back on. So that's the, that's the metaphor. At a later point of time, you can reveal the commitment and uh, say that at the end of the protocol, show that, you know, look, check for yourself that I committed five. Right? So that's the notion of a commitment. Uh, cryptographic commitments were invented around the uh, 1980s uh, by Chom. Uh, the other uh, concept that I require, uh, again from the mid 80s, are something called zero knowledge proofs. And in zero knowledge proof of knowledge, you prove that you, you give a mathematical proof, typically interactive, uh, that you know something. Uh, without revealing any information, even a bit of information about uh, what you know, uh, yet to give a convincing proof that you know the value of X. So you know the value of X without conveying any information other than the fact that you know the value of X, right? So nothing about X. So your adversary can glean no information about X whatsoever. Uh, so what are the examples? Um, examples are that, you know, that you prove that you're of drinking age. Uh, this is an example I use for teaching to IIT students that you prove that you're of drinking age, uh, but you don't reveal your age or, or don't show you any certificate or whatever, but give a mathematical proof that you are above 18 uh, in an interactive manner, but don't reveal anything about any certificate or, or age. That would be a zero knowledge proof. Or you could uh, give a proof that you know two prime numbers P and Q. So you know the factorization of N, uh, but without telling them what P and Q are. So, you, so, uh, so factoring composites uh, has been a challenge in computer science and we have not been able to find a good algorithm to do this. In fact, there is no known algorithm uh, to factor a number like 15 uh, as three into five. Uh, of course, we can do it for small numbers, for, but for large numbers, uh, you know, uh, something that has got say a thousand digits, um, we don't know how to do this, solve this problem. So, uh, so, so of course, multiplication is easy, but factoring is hard. So you can say that you know, I know prime numbers p and q, so that n is equal to p and q, but I won't tell you what p and q are. That would be a zero knowledge proof. Or C is an encryption of M, but I won't show you the encryption of Q. But I'll, I, I'll tell you that this is a cipher text of a message uh, message M without showing you the key. Or I'll, you know, this is a commitment for a message M, but I'll not, not show you the commitment key, but yet give you a proof that this is a commitment of this message. So these are all zero knowledge proofs. These are incredibly powerful techniques uh, called interactive proofs uh, that were invented. And almost any statement, uh, that can be described in NP, which is by a non-deterministic Turing machine in polynomial time, there is a zero knowledge proof. And zero knowledge proof exists. So almost any NP statement can be proved in zero knowledge. And that's a very, very powerful result by, by these gentlemen. So I won't get into the theory of zero knowledge proof, but I'll use zero knowledge proofs uh, in, in what I describe. And I will require this notion of modular groups. So let me see if I can explain this, uh, this correctly. Right? So we will uh, be talking about this sets called Zn, which is a finite set of remainders when divided by n. Right? So if I divide a number by n, the remainders cannot be greater than n, and the remainders has to be in zero to n minus one. So these are the set of all remainders when divided by n, that's called Zn, right? And Zn supports two basic operations, addition and multiplication in the obvious way. So 11 plus 13 uh, 
And if I divide that by 16, that is 24. When I divide by that by 16, the remainder is 8. So we say that 11 by plus 13 is equal to 8 in the mod 16 operation. Or 11 into 13 is uh, 15 in the mod 16 operation, right? So this is how we do additions and multiplications and modular groups. Uh, and why do we call it a group? So the group is a set like this with operations such as multiplication. And uh, it is closed, which is to say that if I take any two elements from this set and do a multiplication, I get back an element of the set because I always divide by n and get back an element of the set. And, uh, and if every element has an inverse element, uh, then, then we say that this is a group. So there's a well-defined algebra. Uh, and a group is cyclic if there is a special element uh, so that every other element can be obtained uh, by uh, raising that uh, by, by powers of that element. So if that can happen, so the, every element of a group G can be written as G to the power X for, uh, for some integer X. Then we say that the group is cyclic, and we say that G is a generator for G, uh, for this group. So this is uh, you know any cryptographic operation will require a modular group of some sort. So we um, choose P is a prime. If P is a prime, then we can show that the multiplicative inverse exists, and uh, then this is a multiplicative group. Uh, uh, and in cryptography, you almost always choose uh, a group like ZP. And you choose large primes, P and Q, uh, typically how large to, you know, for contemporary security, you choose P and Q to be, you know, 3072 bit modulus. Uh, actually, um, for technical reasons, we will be forced to work on electric curves, which are like modular groups, uh, but I don't, you know, we require 128 bit for electric curve, but let's just stick to modular, groups. forget the electric curves. So we require P and Q to be large. So really, really large numbers. And we use a GUQ to be a unique sub, uh, cyclic subgroup of P. And we choose two generators G and H for the group, right? So, so we choose a very large group, uh, you know, of, of 3072 bits. And we choose two generators for it, G and H. And how are these chosen? Typically in cryptography, these are publicly chosen. Uh, publicly chosen like you the randomness to generate the group uh, you pick up from a hash of the first page of indian express let's see right uh, pick up some public text or uh, new york times um, fourth page first paragraph right hash it and get the randomness and anybody can generate this group members gnh right so it was publicly announced and uh, what is assumed is that uh, the discrete logarithm of G and H uh, is not unknown to anyone and nobody will be able to compute this. Actually, you can show that this problem is exactly the same as finding prime, prime factors of a large composite, which nobody knows as I mentioned how to do. So nobody knows how to solve a discrete log. So the assumption is nobody will be able to compute the interrelationship of G and H, but both are generators of the group. Right? So that's all the crypto uh, that we require. Uh, well. So let us move on. Um, and once we have this crypto, we need a specific form of a commitment. Uh, this is a very popular commitment in cryptography called the Pedersen commitment. And how do you compute it? Suppose you have got a message row uh, from, from that group. You compute the commitment as g to the power rho and h to the power r. Know that g and h are public generators. r is the key for the commitment. Uh, rho is the message. So you compute the commitment as, as c. And this Pedersen commitment is perfectly hiding. Why? Because given c, all messages are equally probable. So it leaks. c leaks no information about the message, none whatsoever. So that's what is called perfectly hiding. And Pedersen commitment is also computationally binding. What does it mean? It means that suppose C is made public by uh, computing as the commitment of row, to later to say that to change the message to a row dash with a new R dash will require you to solve the discrete log problem. 
right? So to fake a commitment is almost impossible. So we are assuming that nobody has the computational power to be able to fake a commitment. So a commitment is computationally binding. Once given, the message is sealed forever. Nobody can change the message once a commitment is issued. And the commitment does not give any information about the message, right? And the Pedersen commitment is also additively homomorphic, which is to say that if C1 is a commitment for row one and C2 is a commitment for row two, then C1 star C2 is a commitment for row one plus, plus row two. This is something that we will use out there. So, um, you know, I'll give illustrations of this. Um, so it is not terribly important that you understand it completely, but you, understand, you have to understand the notion of what a commitment is. Right? A commitment is computed using this way, and a commitment once made cannot be changed. Right? That's the that's the take home lesson. That's a very minimum that you need to understand. Okay, so I'll give you three concocted protocol, uh, completely untested, uh, not even implemented. I am not even sure that we are ever going to implement this. So these are just um, results of some coffee table discussions in IIT Delhi. Uh, but I thought that I'll explain these protocols in a sequence. Uh, we call it desi voting, uh, so that. Um, no, just so that I'm able to illustrate what a, uh, what, a, what a voting system will look like. So the first version I'll use, a, not a DRE, but a Preta voter style hand marked ballot. Right? Uh, yeah, so the ballot will look like this. Uh, again, a random order of the candidates. Since they see voting, you know, I should have used the names like uh, Lalu, Kallu, Bildu, perhaps. Uh, so I'm sorry about these Anglo-Saxon Saxon names, but... Um, yeah, so continuing with David, Bob, Alice, and Carol. Uh, so those are those come in random order. Uh, you've got a right-hand side for marking and you've got a left-hand side. And votes are uh, 0 to M minus 1. So we are assuming that even if it's a multi-day selection, the ballots for one uh, election are not confused by ballots. So if you have uh, you know multi-days, just have another table and the ballot for the next constituency in the separate table. Uh, so that's how the... You know, you can choose the race, uh, which race you are voting for, but every vote is between zero to m minus one. Represents an integer between zero to m minus one. So, what is the voting process? So, I made a mistake. It's not blinded RID, but this should be CRID. You know, commitment for the RID. So, every ballot has a random ID, which we call RID. Right. Uh, so, every ballot has a random RID, which is contained in the left part. And uh, the commitments for the random RID and the commitments for these votes are in this QR code on the right hand side. And this top half contains the not the blinded RID, but the commitment for the RID. Cryptographic commitment for the RID is contained in this QR code. Uh, this contains the RID and uh, so on so forth, and this contains all the commitments. What is the voting protocol? The voter detaches the top right part, this part and gives it to the polling officer uh, for scanning. So the each ballot is indexed by the CRID, not BRID. And I made a mistake out here, so read CRID. And uh, the EVM scans the two QR codes and the vote, right? Uh, of the MARF ballot or the, and uh, stores it, indexed by CRID, and prints the RID vote on a slip, you know, on the VVPR slip, right? So, so it reads who you have voted for, it scans the two half, it notes the RID from here, notes the CRID from here, and prints the VVPR slip, it is uh, visible but not detachable. Then it asks the question, that, are you happy? Did you re really vote for Bob? Have I scanned it correctly? So you have at this op uh, stage an option of uh, saying no or yes. Uh, and if you say no, then that has to be communicated to the polling officer and the polling agent sitting outside through an independent channel, which is does not go through the EVM. This can simply be shouting, you know, uh, to, or, or lighting a bulb, you know, another button to light a bulb out there, saying that whether you agree with what has been printed in VVPR or you disagree. But, uh, so if you disagree, uh, this VVPR, uh, 
the word cancelled is printed out here and it drops into a box. And if you agree, it just drops into a box, right? Um, the voter takes the right hand side, uh, the remaining part of the right hand side as, uh, as a receipt back home. Uh, and uh, so this protocol, uh, you know, this is the, so how will we prove it? I'll come to that later, but this obviously has some secrecy issues. And what are the secrecy issues? Which will be considered unacceptable in a voting. First, the VV, first the EVM gets to know your vote, right? Uh, so the EVM knows who you have voted for uh, because it has to print the vote out here. The EVM also knows the random ID and the commitment, it knows both. So it, so you have taken away this as a receipt, which has the CRID in the part of the receipt. So the EVM knows that the person with the receipt indexed by CRID has voted for Bob. So if the EVM leaks this information, then voter secrecy is completely lost, right? So this is something that uh, cannot be considered acceptable as a, as a in, in a voting protocol. Note in an EVM, this is not true because EVM only knows your, in the Indian EVM that is used, it only knows your vote, but it cannot relate the vote to any kind of RID, right? And being able to, so why am I uh, relating it to RID? So that I can give a proof later. But being able to give a proof later makes me compromise certain citrus information right out here, which may not be acceptable, right? But let's, move on with this um, with this understanding and then at the end of the polling i put up all information on a public bulletin board from the evm uh, so you have got this your rid the qr code and you've got the commitment for all the candidates in this case since the tick is in this position you will pick up bob and you can match your receipt of the bulletin board which has got uh, that crid uh, has voted for CBOB. So CRID is known to everybody. Your receipt you can give to your friend and the friend can go and verify. That is indeed on the bulletin board. And uh, this signature by the PO ensures that the holder of the receipt CRID has indeed completed the voting according to the protocol. Did not cancel, accepted the voting and so on and so forth. So note that uh, this CRID was detached and gave, given to the, uh, the PO. The once you have completed the polling, the PO signs this part and uploads uh, either through the EVM or later uh, to the bulletin board. Second bulletin board. Uh, collected from the EVM where we have all the RIDs and the clear text votes, right? So all the RIDs and the clear text votes are, uh, are consolidated in a second bulletin board. Note that uh, the elements of the first bulletin board are receipts. So these cannot be linked to the second bulletin board. If these are linked to the second bulletin board, then everybody will know who, who the, you know, the, the person with this receipt had voted for uh, Karen, right? And so on and so forth. So we uh, give a proof in zero knowledge that the two bulletin boards are in one-to-one -one correspondence. So for every entry in bulletin board one, there is one and only one entry in the bulletin board two. So this proof is given in zero knowledge, uh, you know, construct a ZKP about the one-to-one -one correspondence. So anybody, any member of the public uh, can verify that uh, for every entry on the first bulletin board, there is an entry on the second bulletin board. And these are all the receipts. And we assume that a statistically significant sample of the voters will verify that the receipts are present on the bulletin board one. So anybody can publicly compute the tally on the second bulletin board, right? So this uh, protocol, ensures correctness. This protocol cannot be hacked. On this, you can hack a cryptographic commitment or you can hack the zero knowledge proof, which uh, 
is considered to be next to impossible in cryptography. So, so this is an unhackable system. But of course, there is a possibility of leakage of information from the EVM. So if the EVM uh, leaks out information, for example, in, uh, in some ultra ultrasonic band, it keeps shouting that, uh, look, look, this guy just voted for Congress, this guy voted for BJP, but this CRID voted for this. Since it has all the information, if it leaks it out, then the mapping between the two bulletin boards will become public. And that will be considered unacceptable in an election. So no, see that uh, this brings out the problem that if you have to give a verifiability proof, you have to keep this RID information with you somehow and these commitments somehow. But moment you keep this information, there is a possibility that you will leak this information, right? And uh, if you leak this information, then the voting becomes popular. So, so this is another reason that you don't use cryptography, that, uh, you know, your ability to keep this information secure must always remain a little question, right? Whether you can keep a machine like an EVM secure and that will not ever leak information is almost always an untenable assumption. And hence, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of risk in using a protocol, protocol such as this. Um, okay, but let's move on. Uh, so what is the summary? It is end-to-end -end verifiable. The correctness is mathematically provable. Uh, electronic votes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with a VBPR step. So, uh, so verifiability is not in question. This is strongly software independent. Uh, if at any stage um, any commitment is wrong, the proof won't, uh, the ZKP will not work. So, or a receipt will not be found on a bulletin board. So this is uh, strongly software independent because uh, if you find that uh, you know this receipt does not match, then you know which polling booth it has come from because the polling officer's signature is there, and you have no other option but to do a repoll in that polling booth. But you don't have to do a repoll everywhere, right? So you know exactly which entry does not match. So you can recover from an error by doing a repoll in a localized uh, domain. So it's strongly software independent. It is susceptible to incorrect ballot marking. So if people don't mark their ballot correctly, uh, that becomes an invalid vote. Uh, EVM gets to know all of these, uh, RID, CRID, and the vote, and uh, hence can leak information. So that's a, that's a real danger. Now, I the PRETA voter is also vulnerable to a coercion attack, a randomization attack. Uh, like, uh, for example, I could, uh, you know, the neighborhood Gunda, can tell you that, look, I want you to vote in the second position. Right? Your receipt better has a tick mark here. Now, what does it mean? It means that if the coercer or the neighborhood Gunda knows that you are unlikely to vote for his party, then he can ensure that your vote is randomized, right? That you vote for, he votes for your party with the probability one four for his choice with the probability one fourth and for somebody else with the probability half. Okay. So you can, you can, if you, if you know that there's a person comes from a community which is not likely to vote for you, then you can force them to vote for a random candidate. And that would be considered uh, an attack, which is not acceptable, right? That's a problem with actually all preta voter kind of the system. Uh, so, so that's a, that's a big problem, right? Um, so the verifiability is okay. There is a coercion attack that is possible. And there is a, there is a clear secrecy problem. Okay, right? Okay, let us look at a DRE version of this protocol. Uh, so that is uh, Desi voting too. I'll try to address some of this problem with a DRE system. Now, DRE system, I won't solve this problem, but I'll introduce more problems. What is a DRE problem? The DRE problem is that, that you are now pressing a button instead of putting a tick. Now, that immediately brings in a new problem of contestability, dispute resolution. So, I have to give a proof 
that if you have pressed two, I have recorded two and I have not recorded three. You know, so the so that makes the problem a little more more difficult. Now the Indian EVM does not give the proof, and hence uh, you know it, it is not verifiable. So any verifiable system will have to give a proof that I have recorded your 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 vote correctly. So the ballot uh, is changed a little bit. Uh, so it's not a, not a ballot because uh, now you are pressing a button. So it's a pre-ballot. So it's still a paper. Uh, this part has still the CRID exactly the same for the polling officer. Uh, this part has the commitment for the RID, which is CRID, and uh, has a commitment CU for an obfuscation token U. Right? So I'll tell you what the obfuscation token is for. So you take uh, the RID and U as random from ZQ, put it in the left uh, QR code. These are the ballot secrets, uh, RID and U. In the right QR code, you put the commitments for them, CRID and CU. And these numbers are a one-time pad so that, you know, corresponding to Alice, I have got V. And uh, these are W says that uh, they are U plus V mod Q mod M. Right? So these are numbers, uh, cyclic numbers, says that uh, they obfuscate your vote. Right? So corresponding to, uh, you know, so, so you use VU to hide the word V and note that this is perfectly hiding. Addition is a perfectly hiding operation in a modular, modular arithmetic. So, uh, so the number three corresponding to, that the number three corresponds to Bob cannot be found out unless I give you the one pad time E, e right? So it's, it's completely hidden out there, right? So that's a, that's a value. So what is the protocol now? The protocol is so that uh, you take your ballot, pick up a ballot randomly, and by assumption, all ballots are correct because they're all auditable. So you assume that uh, the ballots are audited. Every ballot that you have picked up is a, is a correct ballot. You go to the polling machine, and the first thing you do is that you cast your vote, right? And moment you cast your vote, uh, the EVM prints out a commitment for the vote. Uh, you know, using the publicly um, public uh, parameters GNH, it prints out a commitment for the vote. Uh, this is the partial receipt. It's printed, but you cannot still detach it. So the first thing before EVM can seize your ballot, uh, it gives you a commitment that uh, this is the vote that I've recorded. Then it says that, okay, uh, put your ballot in the scanner, or please get it scanned. So you get your ballot scanned and EVM then computes and prints W uh, out here, right? So if you have cast for Bob and uh, W against Bob is three, the EVM independently computes from the U uh, plus V that it is three and uh, ask you and also print out uh, on the VVPR slip, the RID and Bob and says that, do you agree that this is correct? The number three is correct, and the what I have printed on the VVPR is correct. So at this stage, you can cancel, in which case both these will be marked cancelled and uh, discarded, and you'll be asked to vote again with a new ballot. Or you can say OK, and if you say OK, then this VVPR will drop into the VVPR sack, and you are given a proof, you are given a printout in a QR code that you know the CU is on your ballot, already. So you are given a printout of the keys for RU plus IRV and you are given a proof that CU star CV is a commitment for U plus V. Now since, uh, so you are given a mathematical proof for this. So this is a proof is in the part of your receipt. You can take it back home and give it to anybody, give it to Hasgate uh, if you trust them and say verify that the proof is correct. So what Hasgate can do from your receipt is that uh, the receipt has uh, CU. The you know the receipt that you take from the pre-ballot is has CU. Uh, this has got CV. So Hasgate can do this multiplication. G and H are publicly verified, so it can uh, verify that uh, this indeed is a commitment for W, which is U plus V, with the key R U plus R V, right? 
And note that uh, it does not reveal U, it does not reveal V, but it reveals the addition, which is perfectly hiding. And this constitutes a proof that the commitment CV is correct because CU is correct by assumption by the audit of the ballot. Uh, that CU is a correct commitment. CU star CV is a correct commitment plus U plus V that has been can verify for you. And this in turn would imply that the commitment per V that the EVM has given you is also correct, right? So this is a proof, a zero knowledge proof. Uh, that your vote has been recorded correctly within the EVM. And uh, the election commission cannot ever go back on, on, on the vote, right? Uh, so if you don't accept it, then you have got a denial of service attack. So you, if you keep pressing error, get a new ballot paper and do this thousand times, then somebody will have to evict you out of the polling booth forcibly. So it's a partial dispute resolution. Right, so they have to keep on giving you a second chance, and if you keep uh, saying that every time the EVM is doing wrong, then you have to be timed out at some point in time. But if you ever accept it, then you cannot uh, raise a dispute anymore. Then the EVM has given you a proof that it has recorded your vote correctly. Right. Uh, rest of the protocol remains. Uh, so this is a way our DRE protocol uh, can give you a proof that your vote has been recorded correctly. The rest of the protocol remains exactly the same. Uh, the two, uh, the two bulletin boards, uh, bulletin board one and bulletin board two. The risks are also the same. Same, right? So the EVM gets to know all your votes, all your secrets. Uh, the if the EVM leaks information, then you are gone. Uh, if the ballot leaks information, then also you are gone. Right? So that compromises secrecy in a trivial way. But uh, we have so far taken care of the verifiability problem. And we have taken care of the problem that we can give a proof that we have recorded your vote correctly. So the only remaining problem is secrecy. Uh, uh, that is something that I'll address in the third protocol. Give me another five minutes and I'll take care of uh, the third version of Desi voting, which will be secrecy preserved. And uh, so what is the protocol? Uh, I'll just describe it in one page. Uh, covered ballot with five sections. Now I'm not drawing anything. Uh, the first section has the CRID for the polling officer's signature. The second section has RID and U, but this time not in clear text. This time it is encrypted, right? This is encrypted using a key, which is at the back end with the election authority, and uh, it uses any encryption key, any strong encryption scheme to encrypt the pair RID and U, U being exactly what it is. The third section has the mapping of candidate to the, to the W uh, and to a random symbol. Uh, the seed of the random number is generated from encryption of RID and U. That itself can be a seed. Uh, so the random symbol, think of the random symbol as something easy for the voter to match. You know, it can be, think of it as, it can even be an emoticon, right? The smileys. Uh, that's a random. So you have got the smiley library, pick up uh, against each candidate, have a W and have a have an emoticon, right? Uh, a random emoticon, seeded by, seeded by encryption of this. And the receipt contains the CRID, the CU, the CV. Uh, the CV to W mapping, RU plus RV, right? And note that from this receipt, this part of the receipt, no information can be figured out simply because of the perfect hiding property of the, of the commitment. Right? So what is the protocol? The EVM scans the encrypted RID and U and the EVM uh, scans this, right? Uh, Note that this time the EVM does not get to know uh, your RID. Uh, it gets to know CRID, but even if it leaks CRID, no harm because CRID is a part of the receipt and hence public anyway. Right? So RID and U are the secrets, and uh, that the EVM uh, gets to doesn't get to know. It gets to know only the encryption for them. So EVM does not get to know. What is the random ID, RID corresponding to this pre ballot? So the voter does not select a vote. The voter selects the 
number W which is against that candidate, right? Which is U plus V. So voter selects W, the EVM prints theta. Right. How does the EVM print theta? Because the EVM has taken the random seat from the encryption um, already. So it knows what symbol has gone against W. So it uh, prints the corresponding emoticon uh, theta. The voter matches the, uh, the emoticon that uh, EVM has printed against the one against of the pre ballot. And if the voter um, has at this stage has the option of not agreeing or agreeing, not agreeing will uh, you know, require you to recast. And if you agree, uh, the EVM already has a proof. You know, this constitutes the RU plus RV gives you a proof that CU star CV uh, has been committed using RU plus R. So that proof is already the voter has with him. So the EVM just signs W on receipt two and gives out receipt two. And EVM prints an encrypted version of RID U and W on the VBPR, right? Now this protocol, the EVM does not get to know the vote. So the EVM uh, does not get to know any ballot secrets. Uh, so the EVM is just a, you know, the, just a collator. So you, the EVM can be a cell phone and uh, you can, anybody can write an app on a cell phone and give it to the polling officer. So the polling officer's cell phone can work as an EVM. The camera can work as a scanner, uh, a simple QR code scanner. And no information can ever leak from, uh, from the EVM. Think of it from the voter's perspective. There is a lot of backend cryptography going on, but what does the voter have to do? The voter has to just take the ballot, enter the polling booth, select the number W against the candidate, look up the number W against the candidate, press that button on the EVM, right? The EVM will print an emoticon which the voter has to match against the ballot, agree or disagree. That is all the obligation on the voter, right? And the voter walks out. Uh, with a proof which the voter himself cannot verify, but voter can take it to Hasgate to verify that the EVM has taken, given a proof that the vote has been recorded correctly. When you audit during VVPR, there has to be a public description of all the RID and U, right? So you pick up a VVPR slip and all the, all the VVPRs can be encrypted using the same key which you give to the counting station. So the counting station needs to pick up a VBPR slip, read the QR code, decrypt, find uh, the vote from U and W, right? Uh, such that U plus V is equal to W. Uh, that's a small computation. And look up the vote and the RID combination on the second bullet info, right? So do a random sample of a logarithmic number of login number of votes and you have got a perfectly verifiable election. Right. So, you know, all the proofs, the theorems and so on and so forth is routine. Uh, they can be easily worked out mathematically. A paper can be written, published in a conference. This is what a verifiable election will look like. Whether it should be used, not used, you know, this is possible. Uh, a ballot secrecy preserving verifiable election is possible in computer science. Whether it should be used or not, ultimately should be the parliament's call. It, it's what the society feels comfortable. So with this, you know, I, I, I hope I have been able to bring out the issues and the complexities of the, of the process. So I'll stop here. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and doubts and uh, I, I may try to answer those. Great, thank you, Sapasha. So it was uh, really detailed and interesting. Um, I do not doubt that there's a, a large number of questions uh, about both the, the specific cryptographic elements, but also uh, details of, of your protocol. Uh, I do wonder if, well, let's just start with this. Um, 
if anybody has any questions, comments, uh, you can either put them in the Zoom chat if you're following on Zoom or in the YouTube chat if you're following on YouTube, uh, or you can raise your hand if you're on the, uh, the call and we'll try to get as many questions as possible. Um, and they're already coming in, but actually, uh, so uh, we have um, uh, Taha Ali, uh, who has, has joined us. Uh, he is based in Pakistan and has been writing on the challenges. Of yes, I have, I, have, I have read his articles and uh, yeah, he, exactly. quoted our, he, he quoted our CC report and hence it was uh, brought to my attention. Uh, I read his articles with great interest in Don. Yeah, uh, he, he wrote an article called uh, How Can We Rebuild Trust in Voting? Uh, and yeah, I, I think this is a, uh, that, that's actually an article you recommended. So uh, Because he asked uh, exactly the same question whether a verifiable uh, scheme should be used in elections or not. And he recommended that uh, the question should be Asked in Pakistan and taken slowly. I think that if I if I read his article correctly, that was his recommendation. Right? Okay. So I think that this talk is a partial answer to that. You know, to, to... yeah. Um, but uh, perhaps if Taha wants to uh, join in and uh, give us a couple of comments or or some insights into his work, uh, th now would be a good time. Um, yeah. Great. Um, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invite. I'll just start my camera, see if it works. Uh, I'll just close the. I'll just close the yes. slides. Right. Uh, sharing. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I just. Uh, I'll just give a brief introduction to myself. Um, so I've been. Uh, I have a background in information security. I. Uh, I did a postdoc at, at Newcastle University. This is about six years ago. And I actually worked on, uh, the project I was on was on end-to-end uh, -end verifiable voting. So my uh, supervisor there, uh, Dr. Fong Hao, he had actually developed his own uh, system, which was called uh, DREI. Mm -hmm. So uh, I came back to Pakistan about five years ago. And since then I've been trying to get some sort of research jump started on this over here. Uh, because this is a very neglected area I've found. In fact, <laughs> this is the first conversation I've found so far in these five years where people have actually looked at how to develop this technology for the developing world. Uh, because all these systems, as you acknowledge, you probably know very well by, by now, they're adapted for Western environments where uh, you have a completely different environment. You have people who are very educated. Everyone has access to the internet. It's a completely different ball game. So, uh, so this has been very, very interesting for me. I'm actually, I wanted, the question I had for you was, uh, you've described three protocols. Do you have a, anything written on these? I would be very keen on getting something and studying these in detail properly and just sinking my teeth into these. You know, this is my PhD student. Um, he's writing it up and he's changing it every day. Uh, so he writes it up and he doesn't like and he changes it. But right. I even so I should be able to ask him to send you an interim question. Absolutely, um, please. So right. I've been uh, so I'm now getting to the point where uh, I have some access to uh, I have a seat at the table in government deliberations and the election commission, and so no one really knows about uh, this technology yet. But I'm in a position where I'm able to start uh, the conversation. And uh, the uh, uh, the report that I cited, the uh, the Indian report, that was a very good introduction in the sense I, I really enjoyed the argument they made, which was that democratic but principles. That's, that's, that's me. Yeah, yeah. That, that was amazing. That was very nice. And this is an argument that we can relate to. Uh, it's something that I haven't seen anywhere else. So I was very, very happy with that. So, so, uh, so uh, Pakistan, I, I don't know if you're following the news, but there are very aggressive attempts to, uh, uh, ambitious attempts, I should say, to uh, deploy electronic voting in Pakistan. And I'm trying to somehow inject some sort of verifiability in some way, maybe not the complete end-to-end -end cycle, but just some small things here and there and come up with a roadmap uh, where maybe in eight years or 10 years, we could have something resembling uh, verifiability, end-to-end -end verifiability, and we're even trying to address some some of the smaller questions, adapt those for the developing world. But it's it's very it's it's a very big challenge, uh, and this is no one's looking into it apart from 
And like I said, I've, you're the first people I've discovered who even have even thought about it. So this is a very nice thing. So you know, if we uh, from the depositions, so, so I am I am not a. I, I must say that I have not interacted with a large number of Indian voters uh, to understand the cultural aspects uh, at all. But uh, from the people who have deposed to the commission, the general consensus seems to be that India needs a DRE. It cannot be a paper ballot based system because, uh, you know, paper yes. ballot apparently poses, uh, you know, you are holding, uh, forcing a person to hold a pen and the person is not used to. So that's, that's, uh, yes. that itself is undemocratic. So uh, button press is apparently, uh, apparently good, but that makes it difficult for E2E because, uh, e, you know, most of the protocols that has come from USA in the cryptographic community are ballot paper based, the E2E systems. So there are very few yes. DRE protocols that are there. So that's why we were trying a DRE protocol and probably it has ended up being too complicated. Mm -hmm. I, it's not an easy thing to do. So I don't foresee an E2E system being used in an Indian election in foreseeable future. It is impossible to even start that conversation. You know, our election commission uh, is not even willing to listen. So, uh, so, yeah. so you know, they, they think... Slightly more lucky here, but yes, please go on. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so uh, I think our limited endeavor has been to say that, okay, go keep going, keep on using the EVM, which is fine, but just make the EVM protocol some. You know, do the VVPAT correct, do the counting correct, all right, and correlation correct. Right. E2E, we will worry about later. Yeah. So that has been the limited endeavor of the commission. Right. But for a group like this, you know, I thought that E2E is something that I should introduce. Right. No, no, th this is very, very good. So, uh, so you're, I, I agree with you in the sense that it is not possible to have an end to end verifiable voting system in the near future. It's, it's the, the problems are too much. And it's not just the technical problems, it's also the social problems and the yeah. uh, political problems and everything. But uh, what, what I'm again, what I'm keen on is that, uh, so we are going to spend if Pakistan is going to, uh, is planning to introduce machines in the next elections or very soon. And we are going to be spending billions of rupees. So that is a huge investment. So at most, what I would like is that we come up with some sort of uh, system which can be easily upgraded to some sort of verifiable. I mean, it should have some sort of upgrade option or something like that. So that if maybe five years down the road, we do finally develop a system which is end-to-end -end verifiable, then it should be easy to adjust. I, I don't know how, uh, I mean, I, I agree with you. So, so what I like about Starboard is that Starboard uh, and, and even Scantegrity too, that they sort of integrate those techniques, verifiable voting techniques with your standard VVPAT and they, so likewise, uh, what so I like, our protocol. That's yes, what we also have tried yes. to do, yeah. So uh, likewise, there, there are lots of other things like you can have, attestation techniques for these machines you can have lots of things so this is uh, it's an ongoing thing and uh, yeah so um, i am i am i'll be very happy to have a separate conversation with you and discuss i, at I would be very happy to have this it would be very very nice uh, i i thought i was alone in looking at these questions and i i'm glad to see that there's uh, so i i haven't even met anyone who has a in this part of the world who has a solid crypto uh, background. I, I don't have a solid crypto background, but this is very, very interesting. So I would be very keen to have a separate talk uh, later on sometime and also to part, uh, join in and view later uh, later sessions uh, of this uh, of this forum. And uh, that would be very cool. So thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. Well, thank you, Ta, uh, for coming and, and uh, uh, sharing your ideas with us. And uh, I, I think that's an interesting conversation to continue with. Um, just a reminder again to people who are watching that uh, you can put in questions and, and comments um, through the various mediums where we'll try to get through them all. Uh, one one thing I was thinking while uh, while listening to your talk, Supashi, was um, uh, there's there's an increasing um, sense I find in cryptographic communities that 
Um, there may at some point in the future be uh, significant challenges to either uh, certain cryptographic primitives, certain hash functions, uh, certain even, um, for instance, uh, discrete logarithm uh, problem being solved in some way. And um, I was thinking, could it be interesting to try to uh, make sure that when you are building a cryptographic protocol for this kind of um, voting system, that future failures in specific primitives would not lead to a historical voting record being exposed. So that is to say that you would, um, uh, the, the fact that the primitive that you relied on to guarantee the, the um, secrecy of the voting, if you had some malicious actor who had collected all of the um, tallying information, uh, that they could not go back and say, aha, we know that Sapash has voted for this particular okay. uh, thing back in 2020 or, or what have you. So, uh, yeah, so... Uh... So in my talk, I use primitives that are computationally binding. Uh, you know, for example, I give the hash function and the commitment, right? The commit, particular commitment that I use is a computationally binding commitment. The computational binding property is considered to be a little unsafe in the cryptographic community because it assumes that you won't be able to factor or you won't be able to solve discrete log. That does not work in a post-quantum world. So if you have quantum computing, uh, you know, uh, discrete log is no longer safe, right? Uh, so cryptography uh, research is trying to solve uh, the commitment problems and the hashing problem in a post-quantum world also. So this is called a forever safe cryptography, right? Uh, it looks extremely complicated to me. Uh, I would say unusable at this point in time. So, but um, you know, as and when you have a post-quantum commitment scheme ready, uh, you can replace the commitment scheme in this protocol with a post-quantum uh, commitment, uh, commitment scheme. But yes, I think that your all your current uh, scheme, like RSA modulus and so on and so forth, they all uh, are based on discrete log assumption that nobody. Nobody can solve the strict law. So I think even before voting, I think the first thing that goes is banking, the stock exchange. It gives me enormous pleasure to even think of it, right? So they have to worry about the post-quantum thing much before the voting uh, voting system will have to. But yes, that's a big concern. That uh, cryptography as we know it today um, relies too heavily on computational difficulty. And that is in danger with the, with the, with the quantum computer. Well, and, and Suman, uh, I think, correctly points out that uh, perfect forward secrecy could address uh, the concerns. And uh, even a weaker form of that, which would be um, uh, simply making sure that you have uh, upfront un unlinkability before the tallying happens mm -hmm. would be sufficient, yeah. I think. Uh, so there are many ways to, to uh, 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 skin this cat, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, to answer Taha's question a little bit, your question that there are a certain school of thought, uh, and I think I agree with them, that says that if you don't use cryptography and you use a VVPAT uh, system, you know that is sufficient. Now I don't know about the sufficiency, but that is uh, that has got some appeal. You know, what is the difficulty first? The difficulty is that that you cannot ever bring the VB pads in one-to-one -one correspondence with the electronic codes. You know, you can match them as a set, but you cannot do one-to-one -one correspondence. And uh, now if the set does not match, so if your VB pad, so if the election does not verify, and if your VB pad count does not meet the electronic count, you have no other option but to do a re-election in the polling booth. Um, which, by the way, India has been avoiding. They just declare the election result. Uh, yeah, they don't match and they declare the election results. But uh, ideally, you should do a repoll in that in that polling booth. Um, so, 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 which means so those are the risks of having not having verifiable. Right? Uh, 
the other risk is a little bit of um, you know the trustworthiness of the custody chain that if you take this uh, vivi pack in a sack and put it in a strong room and open it one month later how do you know it has not been tampered with and you know most computer scientists and cryptographers would uh, think that the vivi pack is uh, you know the trustworthiness of the custody chain of vivi pack is the weakest link in the election but the society doesn't seem to think so you know the society is perfectly happy with sealing the sack and uh, putting it in a trunk and uh, sealing the trunk and putting paper seals on it and so on so forth. so ultimately in a democracy if people are happy with it that is what should work in my opinion right if you know ultimately the electorate should be happy that the election outcome is correct and uh, that you know whatever be the method it does not have to be mathematically proved so uh, so right now i asked this questions of the people who deposed to our commission and they seem to think there's nothing wrong with the sealing the sack and uh, trusting the custody chain right and uh, nobody seems to think that that's a problem now if that is not a problem you don't need to be voted you know you are you are, you are good with uh, traditional trunk safety methods so just to put this into a, a, a perhaps a bit of a contention there's so when you are doing things um say traditional paper pencil balloting you know uh, there's a tendency to pretend that that is not a cryptographic protocol now i i think that in fact it is it's just a, a highly informal and really leaky one but it's one that, that is sufficient and um so saying we're not using cryptography uh is in in a way a uh a bid to say we're not going to formally uh specify what the system does yes uh you know i would i i am not sure that whether you can call it cryptography but it's a definitely an administrative process that you don't understand yeah right? yeah sure. okay. i have I mean, you, the word cryptography means specific things uh, yeah but, uh, so i i for uh, you know one definitely don't understand that what keeps this uh, vivipad sleep uh, safe you know these are uh, very complex protocols this requires form 17c form 20 the various forms that you need to fill up this guy signs that guy signs and so on and so forth so if you ask them that at the end of the day can you prove that this is correct you know uh, nobody no seems to know uh, answer that question but uh, they all seem to believe that if you sign up all these forms and you hand out these forms and so on and so forth and you take seal it off then that's a correct protocol now ultimately uh, i have come to the conclusion as i'm growing old i am realizing that correctness need not be mathematical correctness is ultimately what people believe in and if they believe in those forms and the sign and the administrative processes and so wait then no uh, yeah. and, and 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 in this country people seem to have enormous faith in this, those processes but uh so uh there was a comment from um actually Uh, from Shankar Suman, said, uh, from no. Suman earlier uh, about uh, when using cell phones at any part of the voting process, we're opening up to denial of service attacks, uh, signal jamming, and and I think yeah. we could expand yeah. that uh, comment to uh, also just uh, talk about um, uh, the the device itself being hijacked or or somehow compromised. Yes. Yeah, so well, no. So cell phone is a was a loose use of the word. I'm saying any simple device that has got a processor and a uh, and a camera, so, and and can run an app. Uh, and it does not even have to be online. It has to be actually offline. Right. So what what uh, I am saying is that that if you have a software independent process, just by the very fact that it is software independent. you don't have to design special hardware or software you know uh, if the software does something wrong it will become evident your election will not verify so uh, and uh, why a cell phone or any device of that type you know any any microprocessor that you can pick up together with a camera um, because that device will not even get to know the vote 
right? It will just collect some information and pass on some information. And if it passes, passes it on wrongly, that will get caught. Right? So it cannot leak any information. So anything that is doing you, it, it can make it public without any causing any harm. So that, so the ask from the device is is reduced. If you use an E2E system, which is uh, very viral and software independent. Yeah. Otherwise, so, you have to get get into a massive process of hardware and software certification, which itself leads to a very complex kind of cryptography. And uh, I think that the problem is largely unsolved. But it, how it, to certify? It also eliminates the, uh, <coughs> the the biggest concern that people tend to have with uh, these kinds Hacking. of systems, which is yeah, exactly that uh, that the device itself cannot be trusted. And there, you're just saying we don't care if the device is trustworthy. The only thing we care about is that that it can verifiably transmit information. Yeah. Um, Sankarshan's uh, comment here kind of brings us back to where we were a moment ago about rituals of correctness. Uh, yeah. Uh, interesting concept, and it, yeah. it it makes me think of uh, just in general how how faith in um, any society or any government is is very much based on just um, like do people feel okay with things and you know if if that fails to a sufficient degree then then uprisings happen or revolutions or whatnot so generally speaking as long as everybody's more or less happy everything's going to be fine <laughs> yeah i completely agree yeah Mm. Uh, Suman uh, puts in one, uh, another question. Um, aren't we getting there when we require an EVM to provide a good enough uh, pseudo-random number generator and support a high enough uh, quality hash algorithm? Uh, no, really, because uh, you don't... Uh, the random number generator in the protocol that I presented uh, is not a part of the EVM. The random number comes from an encryption function or a hash function. It's from, you know, you just pick up the randomness from somewhere. So what the EVM is required to do in our protocol three is very, very deterministic computation and very simple computation. There is nothing, uh, it is just scanning and recording and passing it on. It doesn't even have to compute a hash function. Or, it just has to compute a commitment, uh, you know, uh, which is sort of uh, trivial to do. And, uh, so that is a low order polynomial time complexity. Can, or can be done in a low end microprocessor also. So uh, there is no special ask from the EVM. And I think that in the computer science community, when you design a protocol, you always try to reduce the ask from the hardware. You know, a good cryptographic protocol is one that does not have any ask from the hardware. Uh, though, uh, the more interesting question is that, that what do you do at the back end? Because on the back end, you have to keep all the secrets, you know, because you're giving zero knowledge proof. So you need to have all the secrets at the back end. So there is a lot of uh, security assumption at the back end in that protocol, not at the front end. The front end has to be you know, nothing. The back end, you require enclave computation. Uh, you know, you require either secure multi party computation, uh, which is a cryptographic protocol or you have to have a regulator uh, put, put the election commission of India software, backend software under a regulatory oversight and do some kind of a, a trusted computing environment with remote attestation. There is no other way. So you have to trust the hardware there, but then the hardware uh, in the trusted computing environment domains have made a lot of progress and you can remotely check that a software of, with a pre-computed uh, signature is the one that is running. And nobody has altered or tampered that computer. So companies like Intel and IBM, and uh, they are producing hardware that gives you that guarantee. Uh, so that gives you the regulator a lot of choice to, uh, to enforce an untamperable secure computation. Uh, I believe that ultimately, at some level, that hardware will be required. You cannot probably do it entirely with cryptography. You know, some secret keys will have to be maintained. Cryptographic assets will have to be maintained in a trusted computing environment. And uh, I think that the cryptographic community understands it. 
And they say that, you know, somewhere at the core, at the heart of it, there is a hardware trust that is required. But it is better at the back end than at the front. You know, getting a trusted computing environment on your smartphone has not happened. It's sort of elusive. But on an Intel server, I think it is, uh, uh, you know, that is running on bare metal. You cannot do it on a on a, on a, on a virtual machine, but you on a, on a bare metal machine with a, um, yeah. So I think trusted computing and is an approximation of trust available on smartphones, as we talked about last time, uh, with yeah. the uh, inside inside the SIM card. Inside a SIM card, you know, I am not entirely convinced uh, because I think the SIM cloning is a problem. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but I think that uh, what you require is something like Intel's SGX software guard extension. You know, um, so even that is hacked through side channel. But you know, Intel is coming up with better and better ones. Yeah. But so SGX like trusted computing environments are available on the smartphones. You know, these processors also have it. Except that Apple doesn't give you access to it. They keep it for themselves. Uh, but uh, these also have trusted computing environments that only Apple can touch and nobody else can touch. And uh, and they don't expose the remote attestation. But there's no reason why that should not be possible. So I believe that sooner or later, a uh, trusted computing environment with remote attestation has to come on smartphones. Otherwise, you cannot beat the privacy problem. Uh, secrecy problem at all, ever. Okay. So it cannot be done with cryptography. There has to be a trusted computing, you know, verifiable trusted computing environment uh, in your in your cell phones. And it is there on the big servers, but it has to also go on the cell phones. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. I think maybe we do uh, one last Ask if anybody has any any comments to make. Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I I do think um, you know compared to last week. Last week we were talking about uh, like laying the groundwork a lot for for this session. More down to earth things, and this was too technical. I guess this like, was very technical, and uh, I yeah. I'll admit like I've I've been thinking and uh, about these things and reading about these things for many years, and yet I struggled a little bit uh, no. at part. So I'll have to go. No, back. Sorry about that, but I couldn't I couldn't figure out a way to do the cryptography. A cryptographic protocol without the cryptographic. So what yeah, I'll do no. is that I'll mail the size slides to some question. And if there are questions, I can always take them on an email. Right? I'll be uh, happy to answer. Absolutely. And I, I think, uh, at least for myself, I, I expect some others might feel the same way. Um, the what you're presenting, it isn't necessarily intractable to think about. It's just it takes a while to process <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. That's so. you, you need familiarity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. So um, if uh, if that is all, uh, maybe uh, I'll just thank you for for an excellent session. It's been very very informative and uh, give me a lot to think about. So uh, I'll uh, if you want to make a final comment, Subhash, uh, otherwise I'll handle. No, over. I'm good. I think Sankarshan has an announcement. All right. Yes. So uh, Sankarshan. Uh, yes, I did get Natch to announce next week's session, but I'll come to that. Uh, I know we have gone longer than usual, but I think this was required. And uh, I know we, we are framing this session as technical, but I, but I also think that to be able to understand the topic correctly, we need this foundation uh, and we need to process this over a period of time to be able to understand and examine issues arising out of uh, technology is being introduced uh, ad hoc uh, into election. And as Taha points out, it's not just India, right? Across the subcontinent and in other places, there is this great fetishism around technology solves everything, especially when it comes to electoral democracy. So I think this is a conversation that will continue. So a couple of things that uh, I wanted to line up. Uh, one is... Uh, we are going to have more of these sessions and we are looking uh, for two things. One, feedback, obviously. The other thing is if uh, any of the participants, both here and on the YouTube stream, feel that we uh, we should include other experts from various domains, please do reach out to us and we will uh, sort of uh, build our network and, and, and have conversations that are equally enriching. Because when we learn from experts and when we share ideas, we will, we will be able to 
understand this topic in more detail. So that's one. The second thing is, uh, please join the Telegram group for Karana. Uh, even though sometimes it's silent, there is a, there are days when there's a whole lot of discussion. So that was the second pitch. The third one, of course, is the uh, session that's coming up next next week, uh, same time on Saturday. We will be talking with Kannan, uh, who is going to provide us with an interesting concept of how it all works out in the field. Let's say you are actually uh, actually a returning officer or, or involved directly as an administrator in an elections. How does all of that work out? How does it does? What are the challenges? What are the guidelines that they receive? And so forth. I'm not going to uh, do anything more than teaser, provide that teaser. Uh, please look out for the uh, announcement of the talk that's coming up. And uh, I would hope that all of you would be able to make time next week. Uh, of course, Saturday afternoons and evenings are very precious, but you still chose to be here. Uh, we deeply appreciate that. Uh, the transcripts for these two sessions would be uh, posted as soon as we can get, get through it. Uh, and uh, that provides a basis for a lot more other conversations that will spring up.